everybody. Oh, lovely little faces. Look at you all. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is, we're going to be releasing, releasing, Are You The Storm onto social media on uh, week Friday. Um, and I just thought this would be a great opportunity because I miss you all. I um, miss working with you. I had a brilliant time on it. And just, I'd like to just go around the room then, around the Zoom room, just introducing yourselves and what you did on the show and what is your job normally. So um, I'm going to start with Barney. Um, my name's Barney Southgate. I was the musical director and arranger on the show and I was actually in the show as well. So uh, I'm the only person on this call who can talk about it from the, the point of view of one of the performers too. And what I usually do is musically direct as well. Morning. So my name is Eleanor Higgins and I am a it's the lighting designer, so I created the lighting and the looks for the show, um, working with a fabulous group of people here. Um, I have been in the industry forever, it feels like, so coming up to 30 years. Uh, still absolutely love it, totally miss it right now. Um, so my job was yeah, to create the lighting. Um, I work for lots of different theatre companies around the country and I also work as a guest lecturer at Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama, teaching lighting there. Hello, uh, my name is Matt. <laughs> I am a freelance sound engineer and on Eye of the Storm I looked after, uh, operated sound for the show and looked after the radio mics. Ali Palmer, I am a stage manager and I was stage manager for Eye of the Storm. Um, I do lots of things in my job, uh, but on this show, I was also queuing the show, which made everything happen at the right time, most of the time. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Mike Beer. I'm a sound designer for Eye of the Storm, um, which really incorporated in this production, trying to make sure everyone could hear each other and then everyone in the auditorium could hear everybody on stage and piece it together, all the bits of music with all the dialogue and trying to keep everybody happy was my main job, so everyone could hear everything and enjoy themselves while they were still on stage. Um, Matt Gibson, who assisted me on that, also helped uh, significantly on this side of things, but I also put all the system that we designed into every venue while he was doing. So he underestimated what he had to do on this production while he spoke. Um, my job is very much similar to that for most of my productions I do. Um, I work in theatre mostly and sound design is my main source of income. My name's Maggie Rawlinson um, <laughs> and I was movement director on Eye of the Storm uh, and that's my normal day job. I'm a choreographer and movement director and have been like Eleanor forever <laughs> in the industry and um, yes that's what I've always done and hope to continue doing in the future. Hello, my name is Carl, Carl Davis. I am the set props and costume designer for The Eye of the Storm. Um, and my job is to make, design and create everything that you see on stage, apart from the lighting and the projection and the sound. Um, everything visual I, I create and design and have lots of fun doing so. Hi, I'm Andy Pike and I'm the video designer for the show. Uh, I create all of the uh, visual images that you see around the back of the stage on the backdrop uh, and I am I'm normally a video and lighting designer, worked in theatre for forever it seems as well. Yeah, so I just want to just, because I think we haven't really all got together since 2019? Yeah, 2019, so that's like a year, year ago. And just, just seeing, you know, what your memories were. Be nice, no. <laughs> what your memories were of the show, really. Um. I just thought it's been great for me because I've done three different versions now, I believe. Um, the first version we did was in Swansea in the Dylan Thomas Theatre, which had many challenges in there because it was such a small building for us to do such a massive production. I think you'd all agree the size of the production we did in that small <laughs> building was a challenge in many forms. Um, I think we did very well. Do you all agree? We did a good production first time round. Look at all those nodding faces. <laughs> um, it was a very different production in there. As the, it was a very small building. Um, it was in widescreen. So for Andy and Eleanor, it looked, I mean, it looked incredible in that, in that space. 
I wonder if anybody had done anything as big in the Dylan Thomas in that guys before. Um, for me to fit a small musical in there was a, a challenge. We probably put more speakers in there than we did in any of the other areas that we went to, just a small room to make sure everyone got the same experience in there. Um, so yeah, that, was, that had its challenges. And then from there we went to Hong Kong, um, which again was a completely different environment for us because we basically performed in an underground garage, or that's what it felt like to me personally. Mm -hmm. um, and I think my biggest memory for that part was having many conversations about a drum kit in that space because having a live drummer on stage has its difficulties enough um, because the, the drum kit is obviously the loudest part of the musical ensemble and that tends to go into people's microphones but when you put that in a concrete environment as we had in Hong Kong I was very concerned about how that might affect the overall show. Unfortunately, well fortunately for me and unfortunately for Kieran uh, he broke his arm just before we were about to go out to Hong Kong um, and therefore our live drummer couldn't play. So he ended up, uh, we ended up putting his parts on track and he, Kieran still was involved in the show, he still played his part, he still played the piano but he couldn't play drums. So we actually had a really good production again in Hong Kong, uh, there was no challenge against the drum kit so everything worked quite well for us there. Um, and then we brought it back to do the tour. Um, and when we did the tour the third time round, we were going to much larger venues. So we could then expand again on the actual um, sound design. But the challenge in that then was to make it work for Matt's tour on his own. But we did end up having a production sound engineer to help him put it in. So, but it was still against time. Every, you know, we were designing a system so it would go up quickly because there were so many technical elements in the production. Um, it was really important that sound weren't slowing people down to get them on stage, to get the show up and running. I think Matt and I had a lot of fun um, at the Dylan Thomas every morning, didn't we, Matt? <laughs> because it was such, um, it's almost not a theatre space, really, the Dylan Thomas Theatre. <laughs> And occasionally we had to come in and things weren't working. So we had to climb ladders and climb over balconies to get into dusty areas because we didn't have a key for a hobbit door to get through under the costumes to get to where we needed to fit that. <laughs> Breaking in to turn on power. That was quite a fun one. Yeah. Um, well, so the, the Dylan Thomas used to be a garage um, that got converted by volunteers into a theatre. So they, There's a theme you know, going on here, isn't there? There's a theme. So it was, it's a metal framed building with a sort of a metal roof uh, and then they use bricks to build a seating unit and some sort of wings. Um, so it was a great idea and it's a lovely space, but obviously had its own challenges because it wasn't really necessarily designed to be a theatre or a performance space. Uh, trying to find ways of hanging speakers and lights and projectors uh, and incorporating a set into it. Um, but it also meant that... Uh, we had certain power issues and certain things that we thought would be locked off and would never move, ended up pointing in wrong directions um, after the venue cooled down overnight and then we came back in. So yes, as, as Ali says, we had quite a lot of fun. Um, just basically every morning we had a check tick list of um, trying to figure out what should be working and why wasn't it working. And I think we had uh, like a half an hour where if we could get on top of it all, we knew we had a nice easy day. <laughs> I, th I thought I said happy memories. I don't, this is like, <laughs> no, 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 fine, it's fine. Weirdly, weirdly, it was, you know, it was quite amusing. It was, <laughs> luckily, Matt and I were both good at getting there early in the day, to get it sorted. But it was, oh, what's it going to be today? <laughs> One of the useful things about the Dylan Thomas was the fact that the stage was flat. So even though it's quite small, it meant that uh, nothing rolled. Yes. And of course, the desks that were uh, yeah. we, had, uh, we had to have them locked off when we went out to Edinburgh because of the rake. And when we first put them on, all the, all the movement that we'd done, we'd put a desk in place and then it would slowly trickle down <laughs> towards the front of the stage. So uh, things had to be altered. And that was, that was um, challenging to, to go from a flat floor 
onto a rake, but it was managed very well, I think. It's funny, isn't it? When you're in those production meetings and you those those issues are raised, like, well, how's it going to work there? I really do sort of go into my happy space and ignore it. That's why they <laughs> was so good, because you take control of it. Yeah, so I'm sure some of them fix that. We were particularly lucky on tour having an amazing carpenter, Levy. Yes. Who could just sort stuff about and having um john when things went wrong with <laughs> sorry andy with the projections yeah um, well, now that we've just now that we're talking about projection and uh, th i think it was press night i think wasn't it press night we lose yeah so andy do you want to recount the feelings that went through when, when, when that, all that happened press night. yeah press that was uh, that was an interesting experience I was, I was happily sat in the bar front of house waiting for the house to open when uh, I think it was Ali appeared, or I got a phone call from Ali saying, we've got a problem, can you come and have a look, see what the problem is? Um, so rush into the theatre from a bar full of people waiting to see the show uh, to find one of the main projectors, well, one of the projectors, there's three projectors in use on that production, one of them not working at all. Um, in, in a reasonably complex, intricate system with no time to try and trouble, trouble fault, trouble find. So... Uh, really as fast as possible. It's rushing through the system, trying to find where the fault might be, what, what the problem could be, um, before discovering reasonably quickly that it was a terminal fault and there was absolutely nothing we could do about it for that evening. Uh, project, one of the projectors has actually failed completely. Um, and as ever working on something this scale, backup was outside the budget. So to hold a backup sitting on stage, just in case something failed was, was, was beyond the budget for the show. So it was, we're going to cut the projector for the show. How do we work around that? How will that affect the show? How does that affect everybody on stage? Um, yeah, quite, quite, a, quite a stressful moment. Certainly wasn't relaxing sitting through the opening night, that's for sure. I think oh, that's like, you know, from an audience point of view, they love that, don't they? And I know that from us, it's like, yeah, okay, but it's, 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 it is panic stations a little bit, but it's like, it's all credit to that company of actors and Ali really in basically going through that script really quickly, seeing where the issues were. And I think he did that in 15 minutes. There's absolutely no way would I have been calm enough to even think that through at all. And I think that is a lesson that directors really shouldn't be involved backstage at any time really, because it, I think, it's, it's having that clear of clear thought, isn't it? What can we do? Um, and it was, I, I was absolutely, and as everybody said, if I hadn't gone out and made the announcement, nobody would have known, really. For me, in that situation, while stressful, it's part of the major enjoyment of doing live production. The fact that everyone clubs together, works through it systematically, finds a solution and still manages to produce the show. The show must go on. We make sure the show goes on and we will do anything we can to make sure the show goes on. It has to be absolutely terminal for it not to go on. And, that, and that's part of the fun and excitement of, of working in a live environment. Yeah. How was it for you, Barn? That, do you yeah. remember? Do you actually remember that? No, I do. I do. And um, I, I think similarly for the audience, loving when something like that happens and getting to see a different yeah. show, I think from the performer's uh, point of view as well, it's exciting because it means that, you know, everyone's got to chip in and it's going to be slightly different. And, you know, when that happens on an opening night, uh, having rehearsed it and teched it for the last, you know, four weeks, it, it's obviously sort of um, just hold on for dear life and, and go with it. And, you know, I think everyone really enjoyed it. And I'm trying to remember, I think, I think some, some of the actors were having to jump in and, and sort of learn bits of dialogue that were meant to be on uh, the projection so they were then performing it for the first time that night um, and managed to do it all and you know it was great I think Kieran our drummer was performing some of the lines you know from behind the drum kit and having to do an American accent you know off the cusp and uh, yeah it was it was great and it was really exciting. Um, Carl what are your thoughts on it because I think we started talking about it really early on didn't we about the show and everything. 
Yeah, I mean, I was really lucky because I've worked in that space before with, with the NOG, so I knew the space really well. Um, the first venue, uh, Dylan Thomas. Um, yeah, it's a tiny space. I think for me, the problem was fitting a giant uh, life-size caravan <laughs> on set with a live band. <laughs> So that was quite um, challenging, but we had Geraint, our production manager, to help out with that and sort of do the plans. So we measured a lot, um, shimmied a lot. The set sort of, as soon as the set goes in, you, you can't move it. So the caravan was built and the platform for the band was built. And we just had to cross our fingers that, that we had enough space for everything else. And obviously we've never done it before. So it was a lot of trial and error. But then going on tour, we, I was really lucky because it had already kind of been designed. I think the projection was the, the major thing for me that changed. So we went from a full psych going around the back of the stage to just um, a, a flat psych um, that was pretty basic and, and square. So I think that took a lot of sort of brain, brain power to sort of work out that image and how that works with the caravan and whether Andy's got enough surfaces to sort of project onto. But um, it was a collaborative uh, process so everybody is involved and I think this is possibly one of my favorite shows is because everybody sort of had to chip in to make it work um, but all those dramas of, of opening night and projector not working I wasn't there so I just got a phone call <laughs> from the <laughs> production and just say we've got no images <laughs> so for me I, I couldn't help out but what a great team yeah and I think I think I think one of the things that I learned on I saw was that first very first creative meeting where I, I we very rarely get to do this because everybody's especially as freelancers you probably do about six different jobs all over the country mm -hmm. getting everybody in a room is really hard like I think zoom uh, has probably solved that for us now um where we can actually which I think is brilliant because I think the benefits we had of us all going from this one vision really you know this you know I was, I was desperate to make it widescreen and I was disappointed that senior March theatres aren't widescreen which was like a bit of a lesson on the tour but I, I don't think it it was poorer for it at all you know I think it just was a different show but I think that first week I think we were in the Welsh College we all met up and we just clicked through some images of things that we would like to try and emulate um, I think that got us off onto a great start, really, that we all were coming from it from one place, as opposed to, I think what I've learned in this lockdown thing is that everybody is working in little, I talk to the designer, then I go over and talk to Mike, then I go over and talk to Eleanor, then I go over and talk to Barney, then I go over to, it's like separate, so that, and I'm trying to keep it up, but I think from now on, I will always work with the company that I want to work with, and I just say the idea, even before anything is designed, before any, you know, felt tip is put to paper or anything like that. We all come from the same place. It's, it was so beneficial because I think the support I got from you all was just unbelievable. You know, not, I, I get that a lot on other productions, but I think there was something quite magical about this, you know, mm -hmm. and the fact that we, had, we adapted it so many times to suit loads of different audiences i think that's what it because in essence we were trying to put basically put a film on stage that's the, that's what the challenge was you know that's why the bloody caravan so bloody big isn't it you know and i think that's that's the the beauty of having such a good team is you know once the show's been designed and it's in the space michael come with speakers and you've got to sort of problem solve to work out where those speakers have got to go so you've all got to help each other also projection you know how that's going to affect lighting and how you know you have to work together to make it work i mean one piece of the caravan had this ridiculous bar but it was a structural bar that went across the top of the caravan and poor eleanor she had to light through the caravan in the caravan around the caravan also over projection it was a, a light and designer's nightmare but we got through it and and it's it was that team that you know that made it work so we had quite a few problems not just spacing and you know we all had to work together um but we did it really well well we all want to wish cheddar a speedy recovery so what is we there anything that you know like i think um that you wish we had done differently from, from a musical standpoint um, there genuinely isn't. I was so happy with, um, with you know, the way that it all came together. And yeah, as Carl was just saying, the way that each member of the creative team um, 
you know, no matter what they were coming in with, in, no one sort of put up a wall if you if you had an issue. So, um, so for example, with the costume, if we had a, if someone that needed to play guitar, but Carl had, in, you know, planned for them to have a certain costume on at that point that made that tricky, then, he, you know, we'd have a conversation about that. And it was always a kind of compromise and which was great. And similarly, if, you know, I was at the piano but couldn't see quite, then Eleanor would help out and offer a bit more lighting. And, um, you know, obviously the, the two people that from a musical standpoint I was relying on the most uh, were Mike and Matt. And just the amount of, um, you know, support that, that was offered was fantastic. And I genuinely, when I was imagining the music and putting it all together, I don't think I I could, I don't think I could, it could have been any better. I was so happy with it. And even when um, I was talking to Mike about the, the drum issue that he's mentioned when we were going to Hong Kong, he was he was trying his best to say, Barney, please don't use uh, an acoustic drum kit. And I was saying, Mike, I think, I think we've got to. And, you know, to Mike's credit, he went, okay, well, let's find a way then. Let's do it. And... As it happened, we did. Unfortunately, I had to hospitalise somebody to find a <laughs> way. Well, yes, yeah. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, what a strange coincidence. A few days later, our drummer broke his wrist. But um, no, uh, as it happened, we didn't use it. But there was never, I, I never with anyone felt like there was a brick wall, you know, put up. One of the big issues with an actor musician show, uh, from Maggie's point of view, uh, and Gainer's actually, is that you've got actors who are in a scene, but then you'll need them to be playing in the band at the same time and Maggie might want them moving and things and um, and again there was it was always just a, a conversation and a compromise and looking at how how we could make that work for everyone so um, yeah I, I, I was so so happy with with the music and the sound that was created and it was largely in part to just the team of people that are here you know just supporting all of that so I wouldn't change a thing <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I think a, a really beneficial thing <clears throat> for us as a sound team, particularly, is the rehearsal space that uh, Theatre Analog has. To be able to have that space for as long as we need to rehearsing, make as much noise and get as much sound kit in there. It might be small and cramped, but it allows us to get so far through the process before we even hit theatre that it makes our job a lot easier. So. Your space is a fantastic asset to to the team, to the whole team, and to Theatre Manor. Uh, you know, this absolutely has been one of my favourite shows I've worked on, just because it being a fantastic show. But the group of people you guys here getting to work with, and everybody else involved, is uh, it was such a joy because we were all going in the same direction. We were all very understanding of each other's roles, and though you know the most ridiculous conversations you were having at times but were really useful so with Dal and Thomas it's a really low theatre it's it has many challenges to light um bizarrely because the caravan angle being slightly different to the tour and the lower bars it was easier for me to light and Dal and Thomas than anywhere else but um Mike and Andy and I and Carl, we had quite a few discussions of, uh, I really want to hang a light here. Oh no, but I need to put a speaker there. Oh, actually I need to put a projector there. So that kind of, that jiggling we did to make sure that we could make it work for all of us in the best way was, was brilliant to have. Um, and again, it all, that all comes from those really early discussions and being involved from the start. But then out on tour, again, touring always comes with its own set of different uh, problems because you're always trying to make sure you have you know you're giving the audience exactly the same experience wherever you are uh, so you're always work, working to make sure you can deliver that the caravan got a little more problematic for me in that we lost a few more surfaces so we could see into the space better so losing the back of a caravan meant that anything I was lighting from the front would then spill onto the psych and then clash with the projection or then the getting shadows on the bars and you know I you know I will hold my hand up I never resolved it on tour I was never happy with what happened inside the caravan some places it almost it was almost there but um and if to do that again it would need actually in a way it needs probably more elements added back to the caravan to be able to hide lights inside the caravan but you know I think on the whole we we did it and it was great 
uh, the Swansea press night where it all went wrong again. I was going to be like Andy, I was going to be sat watching the show, but um, it became apparent that I needed to jump on the lighting desk and fill in new gaps which suddenly appeared and just busk it as I went along, which was brilliant. There's nothing more exciting than that pure adrenaline run of, right, come on, we can do this. And, uh, you know, that's what, that's the joy of theatre, isn't it? That, that's the joy of everybody in our industry is that you can think on your feet and you can, can make things happen and you can aim for always giving the best experience to the audience out there. So, yeah, wicked show. Loved it. <laughs> That's been, that's been really good. Does anybody want to add anything at all? Anybody want to just, before we move on to another topic, really? Just to, only to say that um, we were also incredibly lucky with our performers. Mm. Not lucky, but, you know, we had a fantastic bunch of actors who, in those moments of, right, it's all got to change, they were up for it and excited, like Barney said, and... Um, very easy to manage that company they were just delightful and really loved the show and that it really showed that they they had invested themselves in it yeah it's great yeah i think i think that's you know on because we have to recast as well so there was lots of new additions to the company um but again everybody just slotted in perfectly yeah you know completely blessed by that really because it is it is I think touring you know again one of the things that Nanorg has realized on that is that you cannot expect people to do 14 hour days in a dark room not have a hot meal you know we need you know that looking after people was really clear on that I think people well, I, this is the this is the thing isn't it freelancers go over and above often you know, and the care for them, it was so evident on that. I think I remember people going, oh, it's okay. They've already done, I don't know, say, say they've done 11 hours. And then somebody's going, yeah, I'll be all right. I've got a pasty from Greg's, you know, because you're evening me. And it's like, oh, what? So it's something that we've sort of instigated that they will, we will either bring in catering during tech time or that we're in a place that doesn't, the only place to get any hot food is the Greg's by the bus station. You know, it's just not. Um, but, you know, it's like I've been working 20 years with Nanorg and it took, took something like that for me to realise that. But, um, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's been, you know, it's, I the Storm has done great things for Nanorg, absolutely. You know, it's, um, it looks wonderful, all those images. It's, it, it's, it's ambitious as a show. Um, and I think that's one of the things that Nanorg loves to do is like sort of push the envelope a little bit, but we can't do it unless we have the team around this sort of go, yeah, that is possible. You know, that is, we can't do this. So it's, it, the, the personnel is key, really. So just going back to like a really depressing thought now, everybody. How are we all in lockdown? How have we been managing? So, so Andy, how have you been coping? Me, actually. It's actually been great. Um, it's been nice to spend some time at home. See some, see something in my partner because I'm so often working or away. Um, just, just spend a bit of time in the house. I'm, I've had work to do as well, so I've been, I've been lucky as a freelancer that I've had some stuff come in that's that's kept me busy. Um, I did have, I had four weeks right at the start of lockdown with nothing, which was almost like a holiday. Um, and then, and then, whilst it's been working from my desk, which I do a lot of anyway, um, it's been it's been a really pleasant experience for me. I just hope it doesn't go on too long. Because I've pretty much eaten my savings now. Yeah, similar to Andy in a way, actually, it's been nice to actually have a, a time where you are forced to take some time out. I think all of us, always as being freelancers, we're always striving for the next job. You don't know when that's coming, so when people offer you your next job, you take it and sometimes you sacrifice time at home with your family because just the natural the nature of being a freelancer means you don't know when the next job is coming so you were just yeah i'll have that job i'll take that job i'll take that job so to suddenly have no jobs on offer at all and all the work that we did have taken away from us um it's nice to actually take some time um i was actually mid-production when we when the lockdown came in um and fortunately for us it was a, a job that they were able to pay us for three weeks even though production didn't go ahead. So there was a little bit of a buffer 
in that side for me, uh, which meant I could actually take a couple of weeks off as a holiday properly. Um, I've really enjoyed being home with the family because um, both of my girls are in university and they've both been home as well. So it just means we've all been together, which potentially I didn't think would ever happen for this length of time again. Um, they had flown the nest as far as I was concerned and potentially would not come back from uni. And suddenly they've both been back for 12 weeks and the clock's ticking and hopefully they will go away again soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean that at all. It's lovely having them home, but I, I do feel that for me, I can keep myself entertained. They've hit a point where they can't see their friends. They can't go out and they need to go out and live their life. They, you know, I'm at an age where I've done that and I really see their difficulties far worse than mine. Um, for me, at the moment, I'm fine. My th big thing, as I would imagine it is the same for everybody, is the future and when we start back. Um, there's only so long we can keep going for like this and there becomes a point of what is the future for us? What is the future for our jobs? Will I have a job to go back to? How long will that be in the future? And if it's too long, what do I need to, to do be between jobs? Um, so that, that is the worry of what's going to happen between now and September, January. There's no fixed time. So it's, it's trying to work out what, what the next phase is for myself as a sound designer and whether I can keep that up or if I need to go and find something else to fill that hole. That's the difficulty. I think that's, just jump in there, I think the thing that sort of scares me is the wealth of experience that will go. You know, it's the reason why we were able to think on our feet, I think, is because we there's a lot of experience in the room, really, that knows, oh, something's happened before, like that. I know what to do there. You know, you can't, that you can't, well, you, you, you should put a price on it. There, there's a value there that theatre is, is basically living off. Mm. Um, so, I, you know, there's things like that I think may need to be readdressed. Um, Eleanor, how have you been surviving lockdown? Uh, again, like Andy and Mike, it's, it's been amazing spending some time at home. Uh, I moved nearly three years ago to West Wales by the sea. I'm looking out my office window, watching dolphins leap. You know, you can't, you can't knock it. Uh, and I've spent the three years going, wouldn't it be amazing to just try and spend a bit more time at home as well? But the nature of the work means that I'm never here. So from that side, that's been amazing. Uh, it's been great spending so much time with my husband. I don't think that's happened since we went travelling in 2004. I think he's a bit kind of, he's like, what are you still doing here? <laughs> Surely you should have gone away again by now. Um, so that's lovely. Uh, I feel I was incredibly naive at the start of this. Because uh, I've been, I've always been paying more attention to what's been going on in China rather than how it was happening in Europe because I thought uh, generally we were all so so slow in actually acknowledging what was happening but I genuinely thought okay yeah three months uh, batten down my hatches have a bit of a break and we'll be back at it but obviously that dawning reality of of needing the social distancing you know I absolutely get why we can't go back into those buildings yet what I don't get is it's been it's been it's not depressing it's more than depressing it's it's been quite frustrating to see that we have no acknowledgement in the wider world um and that's been you know obviously you don't do your job because you want oh look at me look at me but you know you do want your industry to have a bit of recognition and i think you know we are all so good at being able to think outside the box, make things happen, that I think amongst ourselves, we can so get theatre back up and running again, but we just need a bit of support to be able to achieve that. You know, I, I have no idea when we will be back, but I know that we will be back because we're one of the oldest, you know, what, 3,000 years of theatre, a, a bit of a, a bit of a pandemic's not going to stop us. It's just putting on up breaks. It's just how we continue through it so I suppose it's also been quite interesting to find out what the minimum 
we need to spend a month is and you know that whole budget side of things because again because I'm never at home I've never really been able to work out what our expenditure is because I'm always paying for trains I'm always in accommodation sometimes that's covered by companies which is brilliant and all always covers expenses not all companies do unfortunately and we are I don't know, maybe foolish to go, oh yeah, I'll do that job, but yeah, okay, I'll, I'll sleep on a friend's sofa to make it happen. That's, maybe I'm, I don't think I'm too old for that. Maybe I should be too old for that, but um, yeah. So it's right now, you know, we'll see what, if anything does happen today in Parliament. I'm not particularly hopeful. Um, right now it's unnerving, so just kind of, enjoying the sunshine while I can I think. I think I'm doing fine it's been it's night. Nice, you know I'm very lucky where I live I'm in the country I can get out I'm just over the border in England I can travel further than you lot um we've got nice places on our doorstep so and I've got a garden and and that's kind of my world is is just here now I'm trying not to look too far ahead because I don't know where it's going to take me. And I can't see theatre coming back in for a long time as we knew it. And whether there is a place for me when it does come back in, I don't know. Because I don't know what that will look like or... or well, we don't know what it's going to be like. Um, but like Elle, I have the optimism that theatre won't isn't going to go anywhere. It might be having a little snoozy right now, but it's not going anywhere because there will always be creative people who will have to create. You can't stop that. So um, I know that there will be theatre back. If it's, it'll be different for a while or even a long time, that will have to be the, the way. Yeah, it's going to be hard, but I, I am optimistic for the future of theatre. Where I am in it, I'm not sure. So at the moment, I am enjoying being at home with my family and hopefully can go camping at some point, <laughs> which would be good. Yeah, but yeah. Thanks, Sam. Matt? Uh, yeah, um, it's pretty much the same with everyone. It's been really nice to enjoy some time um, with friends and family, especially I got married last year and uh, a few months uh, with my wife. It's been great because she was supposed to be in York and I was supposed to be um, in Taiwan, like it was now, on a, on a, on a tour. So, um, so it's been lovely. Um, what I'm looking forward to in the future, obviously, apart from the industry starting again, it is actually how we can creatively add to what we've got. I think the nice thing with Eye of the Storm was that we were able to utilise the technology um, with um, with the digital sound equipment we had and the projections and the software available to us. So we actually created a large-scale show, but actually in a quite small space with actually quite a small team of people and um i don't think we would have been able to do that 10 years ago i think the, the way technology has changed and adapted was it allowed us to be more creative and achieve more and obviously with more internet access related tools like zoom um how we can creatively come up with fresh ideas hopefully to kick start the industry again um uh, from next year and beyond so if there's something like this happens again it won't hurt us as badly yeah it's been it was really weird as soon as it sort of happened and, and i had a, a one phone call to sort of say you you you, you haven't got a show we've, we've cancelled it i think i had 12 shows cancel in the same day and it was really strange because i was costume i was running around ross and y around the charity shops costuming this five short films um which i have all the costumes in my spare room stacked up still and it was just really strange i it just everything stopped and I remember just going into my friend's house and just going what's happening and I just thought brilliant I've got all this time to grow veg in the garden I can have a holiday instead of doing so many shows at the same time started making my own work um, 
and then it just got to a point where I just got super bored and I was like, my brain can't go anywhere. I wasn't getting emails. You know, my day of waking up in the morning, I pick up my phone to get an email and nothing's there. And it was brilliant for a couple of months. Um, but now I'm just waiting for an email, even the email this morning to say, here's the Zoom chat link. Yes, there's something to get up for. Um, so that's all been really interesting because I feel healthier. I think mentally it's, it's sort of made me stop. Um, I'm not running around shops propping because things have changed in the show, which I love. Uh, but just having that that thought of I'm having to get money, I'm running around, get back into the rehearsal room. It's just made me stop a little bit and made me think, actually, I don't want to do 12 shows at the same time over the, you know, um, I want to do quality shows and I want to put my all into that show. Um, so that's really, really good. And I always knew that would be a, somewhere I wanted to go. Um, but now I'm just a bit, I'm just waiting to see what happens, you know, like Andy, my savings are being eaten up, um, but I've saved some money, you know, that's how, how we work. Um, but I just don't know. I, I, I think just staying creative, doing lots of Zoom chats for universities, talking about my job, what I do, which is really interesting because I don't really know what I do. I just do it. So to talk about it, it's um, for me, it's great because actually I go, whoa, yeah, I do that and I do that and I love that and that's creative and that's brilliant you know, oh God, you know, there's loads, loads that I do in my job, but like all of us, um, actually to pinpoint it, it's, it's a lot and I really, really enjoy it. So I think I've just slowed down a bit, um, and taken it in, I've watched everything on Netflix, you know, and I've been outdoors and I've got the kayaks in the garden, so I can't really complain. Um, but I just can't wait to see people and just be in a room, not a Zoom room, but a room <laughs> where we can just sit and chat and, you know, feed off each other and feel people's emotions and facial expressions you know I, I just miss that I think thank you Carl and Maggie Moo <laughs> thanks Gaynor <laughs> you're welcome uh, it's it's been quite devastating for me really um, I mean all my family are healthy so there's lots to be thankful for um, but uh, the day we had lockdown was supposed to be my first day of rehearsals in Pitlockery um, and like everybody else, things just stopped. Um, and yeah, the beginning, it was fine. It was nice to be home. It was nice to have my partner, who's also freelance, home at the same time. Um, my younger son moved out the day before lockdown. He was very happy. <laughs> so he's, um, he's doing very well. He's um, fully employed and was working from his new home. Um, he's a sound engineer and he's been editing at home and, and he's been fine. So, yes, he's had a great lockdown. Um, but uh, I've been, I've tried to stay creative. I've been doing dance classes online with friends who aren't professional dancers. I've been choreographing dance routines for them just to keep ourselves engaged, which has been a great laugh. But, um, yes, I, fortunately, the job I'm doing at Pitt Lockery has been postponed, so it will happen in 2021, all being well. Uh, so there are things to look forward to, but all my work from September onwards has, as far as I'm aware, just been cancelled. It's, it's not going ahead, and i don't know whether i'll be working again this side of christmas really and uh that's quite devastating and it's hard it's like it's like carl said you know i want to be in a room with creative people and not just in a chat room like this and uh the nature of my job means that social distancing you know people moving and dancing dance with each other so uh yeah it's it's tough it's tough and I'm sure as, uh, I mean, to put a positive spin, theatre will survive, it will come back. Um, but uh, yeah, how it will look, it, it's just gonna take some time before we get back to what we know. And I don't think it will ever return to the theatre work that we, we know it will have evolved and changed. And I'm sure in a way that will be a good thing, but um, yeah, I miss it. Like uh, most people have said, the positives have definitely been, you know, being able to spend a bit more time, well, a lot of time at home with, you know, with your loved ones. So my wife and I got married a year ago next month. So we've been able to 
sort of test our, our marriage by spending almost all of the first year in each other's company and we're not filing for divorce quite yet so I must be doing something right um, but it's also been lovely because we moved to Cardiff two years ago and to be honest I've been fortunate enough that since moving here I've been working so much that I haven't had a chance to properly explore the area and get to know it so um, it's been great for that as well that's been really nice um, it's been quite difficult because all of my family are based are in England um, and a lot of my friendship groups so obviously I haven't been able to see any of them um, I think one thing that's felt that's felt nice being in in Wales throughout this lockdown is the feeling of the the government here you know um, really putting putting the health concerns of the public first and foremost that's certainly how it's felt um, so that's been good I think what's been quite difficult as Eleanor sort of said is this this sort of growing feeling that as theatre workers we're perhaps not deemed quite as important as I I thought maybe we were and um, I think when you combine that current lack of support with um, you know the the imbalanced support given to the self-employed or as in my case um, you know a renter um, that's all been quite quite difficult especially reading it we've got so much time at the moment you read a lot you watch the news a lot so you sometimes feel like you're being beaten over the head by it a bit but I think it's important to to uh, stay tuned in and to you know get to know the, the state of affairs with, with these things um, so I'd say that's been the most difficult thing yeah this growing feeling that, that yeah the theatre industry isn't isn't deemed as, as important as as I certainly think it should be Thank you, and thank you to that dog, which isn't my dog. <laughs> a great sound effect. sound effect, brilliant sound effect. Your support for the theatre industry. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's it's. You know, there's nothing new here. Do you know what I mean? I, I've just been hearing this time and time again. My fear is that the people that have that, again, going back to that experience, the value that is in the room is just, you can't put a price on it really. And that does, that does really concern me. Um, I'm just gonna, you know, just like very quickly, going back to that thing of young people now, is there an industry to train for? Is there an industry to go into? And thinking of yourselves back at like, 16, 17, wanting to go into theatre or not, do you, would you advise them to go into theatre and to carry on this passion that we all obviously have? Uh, I'm going to say yes on the grounds of absolutely, it's an unknown at the moment. We don't know, uh, we can't see what that path is yet. But again, I think uh, for me, I do look, um, I look further east than, than what's happening in Europe at the moment. I look at the theatres which are open in Taiwan and in South Korea. Um, and you know, that side of the world had to deal with SARS whilst we were all a bit like, la 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 la, what's going on over there? We paid no attention, absolutely no attention really to the horror which was going on over there. So they've had a cultural shift of, okay, this has happened let's deal with it let's get on it now and then let's move forward i had um, a brief conversation with uh, an xma one of my xma students uh, who's a taiwanese lighting designer fantastic lady and she's saying you know how the theaters have opened up and how they're moving forward and how they're doing it so although here at the moment who knows who absolutely knows whether you know what's happening uh, yeah no, don't give up because we are still creative. You know, if you're a creative person, you are going to want to find a way to to release that creativity. So, yeah, hang on in there. We'll be bouncing back. I can, as a, a choreographer, I can talk um, from the point of view of dancers as well as actors. And dancers will have been training from the age, well, probably ten. That's when I started training properly. Um, so, I know a lot of young dancers at the moment who are on pause and they've, they've just graduated or they've just done their first year of work. So they're not getting any support either. Um, and they're at the height of their game in the sense of their physical ability and they're not able to work. And I think that's such, such a shame that they're on hold. It will come back, but it's, um, 
when you're talking about whether people go into the industry, there are a whole set of people that have been training for years. And that would be such a devastating waste if, it, if they were to just leave and go into something completely different. And I don't, I don't think they will. I mean, I, we, we, we need dancers, we need actors who can move. <laughs> um, and 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 uh, yes, Barney. And, <laughs> um, yeah. So so yes, I I'm I hope people will still go into the industry, but uh, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Okay, you know, I think from a technical and stage management point of view, um, it's absolutely worth going into the training. Um, people will always be creative. And they'll need an outlet for that. And the industry will always hold that. But nevertheless, skills that you're taught as part of that training are absolutely transferable to other industries. So if it does all crash, if it does all fall apart, if you decide you don't like it, it's, it's not difficult to take those skills and move them across to transfer them to another industry. And a fair amount of people do that. A fair amount of people do a few years in the business. And whilst they love it, they find that the hours or the lifestyle isn't for them. It, maybe they get married, have kids, find it doesn't it doesn't suit their lifestyle, and they transfer to other industries successfully. So absolutely, people should continue to train in this field. I agree. I think, as Andy says, you know, it is transferable. I mean, I've I've always done theatre and I've always made costumes and made sets and painted, and now I'm painting cafes and shops and people's houses. You know, I think by by going into this industry, you're connecting with people, you're learning how to work with people, and they are transferable skills. Like how many other jobs do you know, you know, where you can be that close and come up with, with you know, a fantastic theatre piece. But I think also we're, cha we're not, des as a designer, I'm not designing shows for black box theatres anymore. You know, we're, we're thinking outside the box and I think that's where we're gonna go. And I think if you're starting out and you want to become a designer or an actor or whatever, just think about, you, you're gonna be le learning new things, but also taking on all of the different things that, that we've done before in theatres. You know you know how that works or, you, or you'll be trained to know how that works. So yeah, absolutely. I just stay creative and keep doing it. It's no brainer for me. Well, the, the industry is gonna come back in some shape or form. And I think once every, once we've got over this and we're back into theatres, which we will do eventually, it may take some time. It, it might be a couple of years, really, till we get right back on our feet, but it will be there. And for me, the feeling of that nervousness before we're about to put on our performance and the feeling at the end of the performance when that crowd is standing on their feet and applauding, those two feelings for me, I, I would want anybody to to have that experience and feel that there is nothing like it. And that is why I enjoy my job so much. All the bit that happens in between is a delight and it's why I do it. But those two feelings, either side of that make the job worthwhile, putting on something for other people to sit and watch and get them entertained. And for them to leave that building on a high because they've really enjoyed their performance is the best thing. And to feel that I cannot wait for that moment to come back. Well, I'm just going to finish there because that's so cool, my beer. This has been absolutely brilliant talking to you all. It's so, it's just, your honesty is just wonderful, absolutely wonderful.